Action on Purpose, Teleonomy in Living Systems. Uh, our next presentation is another double act, uh, Professor Stuart Kaufman and Dr. Andrea Rowley from the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle. And they're going to address us on what is consciousness, artificial intelligence, real intelligence, quantum mind and qualia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I guess you can see my slides and uh, hear me. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> good day, everyone. I'm uh, really glad and honored to be here. So thank you again. Um, I'm Andrea Roli from the University of Bologna in, uh, in Italy. And uh, this is a joint talk with Stuart Kaufman. As you can see from the title, uh, we are quite in tune with the previous uh, talk. Uh, that was concerning consciousness. And actually, we are trying to find uh, uh, independent uh, and alternative grounds for what is consciousness and why it might have evolved. And we will start this uh, discussion from artificial intelligence. Then we will move to real intelligence and, uh, and mind. Um, since the Dartmouth Summer Workshop that was held in 1956, which is somehow the official inception of AI, uh, we witnessed tremendous achievements by these systems. They, we, we have systems currently that perform uh, with outstanding performances in uh, very specific and narrow domains, uh, not to mention the, the systems that can play uh, go and, uh, and chess or play other games or recognize faces and so forth. Uh, but we are asking now, what is about now the, the old dream or even nightmare, depending on the, the viewpoint of artificial general intelligence, meaning a form of intelligence, a kind of intelligence that embraces several different capabilities. Um, I know that it's diff very difficult, if not impossible, to provide a formal definition, but let's list some uh, properties, some features that we expect an artificial general intelligence uh, should have. Mm, well, first of all, we uh, expect this to be able to reason, to learn, to infer, to use common sense knowledge, to autonomously define and adjust its own goals, to deal with ambiguity and ill-defined situations, and last but not least, to create new knowledge representations. Well, some of these capabilities, especially the ones concerning reasoning, concerning uh, optimization, have been already achieved to some degree. However, we have to observe that current AI systems fail in dealing with ambiguity and especially in creating new knowledge representations. And we believe that the reasons for that, for this failure, rely in the fact that these properties have their ground on affordances. So let's discuss this and see the implications of uh, the properties of affordances for uh, computers and Turing machines. We, we take here a, a broad definition of affordance, uh, saying that it is the possibility of my use, so it is uh, referred to me and my goals, of X, an object, a situation, uh, that I can use to accomplish a goal Y. Um, evolution. Uh, makes, uses of, makes use of affordances in that organisms stumble upon ever new affordances that are opportunities for them, and they seize these affordances by heritable variation and natural selection. And in this way, new opportunities, new opportunities are taken and new opportunities are opened. Ever new uh, adaptations are now the result of these seized affordances. We humans do something similar uh, when we do jury rigging, when we combine objects and use tools in such a way that uh, the goals that we have can be achieved. 
and we articulate objects, we articulate the properties of the, the tools in such a way that the problem we have to solve in order to get to that goal uh, can be tackled. We have to observe here that any physical object has alternative uses of diverse causal features. And an example for this is the engine block. Of course, it can be used as an engine in a car, uh, but I can use it also as a chassis for a tractor. No one forbids me to use it as a paperweight or to lock the door against the, the wall if there's wind, or uh, I can use its corners to crack open coconuts. You can see that we can articulate this object in many different ways, depending on the goals that we have. And if we look at this uh, uh, phenomenon, look at this process uh, in more detail, we have to observe that there is no deductive relation between the uses of an object. I cannot deduce the fact that I can use the engine block to crack open coconuts from the fact that I'm using it as a paperweight or as an engine in a car. And the number of the uses of the, the engine block of any object alone or combined with other things, we may say it's infinite. Well, actually, no, it's indefinite. It's unknown because it depends on my goal, my actions, my affordances, the affordances that I see. And moreover, there is no ordering relation between the different uses of an object. So I cannot say that one use comes before another one. Therefore, all the uses of an object are not listable. And this has a profound implication and consequence on what we can do with computers. In fact, let's consider algorithms and programs that uh, are the implementations in a computer language or in some, uh, with some formalism of these algorithms. And let's observe uh, um, from the abstract level what is the kind of computation that they do, especially when they have to um, operate in such a way that a solution for the real world has to be found, for example, automatic planning. We define as programmers symbols that are linked to objects in the physical world, and this connection is made by us by means of an, abs an abstraction. And these objects are defined along with the relations among them. We can then combine uh, objects by means of relations and uh, in such a way that we can obtain new objects, but everything is set beforehand by us. Moreover, each object has a predefined set of elementary properties. We can derive, we can deduce uh, other properties, but the elementary properties are defined uh, with the initial model, initial abstraction that we provide. <coughs> of course, we, cannot, we, we can also add new properties, but as, a pro as programmers, so we change the abstraction or we set up a specific training phase in such a way that the system can learn what we actually wanted to learn. Concluding, we can say that an algorithm can compute all the possible combinations of these predefined properties on the objects by means of the relations that we have uh, defined, but it cannot find novel properties. And this, uh, this characteristic is very well explained by comparing um, a Lego world in which we have bricks and the specific rules that we use to combine these bricks to put together these bricks. And this is the realm of algorithms in which we have predefined objects and predefined relations between them. We can create infinite constructions if we have infinite bricks, but we have to get stick to these rules and to the properties of the objects. While in the physical world, we have the, the bricks, we have the Lego bricks, but we have also tape and maybe also a tool to cut these bricks into, more, into smaller pieces. And here we have a completely different universe of possibilities. The implication for this to Turing machines, which 
actually perform in several kinds a deductive process is that they are inherently incapable of recognizing novel non-deducible affordances. And the reason is simple. Actually, they just manipulate symbols and the meaning of these symbols is provided by a link that we externally provide. But someone may ask, okay, but you have also robots and robots are actually embodied computational machines. They interact with, with the physical world by means of their sensors and they act by means of their effectors and actuators. First of all, we provide sensors and actuators. So we already define what is relevant for the robots. But apart from that, these robots are anyway um, able to find and recognize some opportunities by means of their deductive procedures. And they can also discover something new maybe, but just through randomness. And the time scale for uh, the success of this uh, makes this impractical for real world applications. And there are also two main issues concerning robots. The first is symbol grounding. So we ask how we can attach symbols to sensory motor patterns. And this is not a computation. This is, as Arnold say, uh, physical dynamics. And we have a second issue that is the frame problem. We have a wealth of information that the robot can receive, but it has to select the pieces of information that are relevant for its purposes. And this is still uh, an unsolved issue. So concluding, uh, universal Turing machines, whether non-embodied or embodied, cannot find novel affordances. And here I stop and I pass the control of the screen to Stu. Thanks, Andrea. I did something wrong. You, you have to, to select the window of PowerPoint. So just, just stop sharing. I have, I have ruined it. No, that's okay. Uh, do you have the PowerPoint open? Because I can see the dot under the PowerPoint, so it should be open. I am not seeing you at all. I've done something terrible. Okay, hold on. I'm going to stop your share and just just start it again. I can't even see my screen. I let me leave and rejoin. Okay, let's give it a few seconds. He should be back soon. Can you see me? Yes. I think you'll have to give me a minute. I think that my yeah. colleague. Andrea, do you by chance have his presentation and can you run it? I have it, just a sec. Sorry, everybody. Andrea, I still have your document. Can you get up mm -hmm. mine? Something's happening. Uh, you should open your uh, PowerPoint presentation. Is it open? I no, I can't open it. Ah, do you want me to share this for you? Yeah, it is really weird. Oh, it just came up. Never mind. Okay. Uh, now. I do. Sorry, everybody. I pre Andrea, can you share it for me? I only see your screen. 
Yeah, sure. Just, just a moment. Can everybody see it? Yep. Yes, all good. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to continue then. The issue is what is consciousness? And just proceed with the next slide, if you will, Andrea. So let me talk first about the ontological importance of affordances. For biologically evolving affordances, seized affordances become adaptations and they enable the organism to get to exist in the, in the universe. The universe is not ergodic. It will not make all possible complex things like human hearts. Human hearts exist because life started and with it, human hearts evolved. So evolution proceeds by organisms stumbling, of, stumbling upon ever new affordances and seizing them by heritable variation and natural selection. Evolution tinkers together adaptive contraptions, as Francois Jacob said. So getting to exist and adapting by heritable variation and natural selection works, but it's very slow. Next slide. So Harnad says, in animal and human behaviors, the issue is doing the right thing with the right thing. But that's precisely making use of an affordance, an opportunity. This is beyond compatibilism, the problem in the philosophy of mind. And it bears on the symbol grounding problem, as Andrea just said. And that solution requires solving the hard problem. We think we may be giving a way to solve the hard problem. We'll see what you think. But there's been no problem and no progress on the hard problem for a very, very long time. To come to the conclusion that Andrea came to, neither non-embodied or embodied universal Turing machines can see novel affordances. This means something very big, assuming we're correct. It means that no classical dynamical system, no classical physics dynamical system can see affordances. But we can. So how? For example, we can see and laugh at the idea of using an engine blocks corners to crack open coconuts. How do we do that? So I want to turn now to the alternative possibility that mind is quantum. There's evidence for it, and then we will show you, if you will, a logical need for it. So in, in quantum mechanics, uh, if you know about it, there's this amazing phenomenon called spatial non-locality that Einstein thought was impossible. Uh, and roughly it is, if you have two entangled particles and they're now uh, billions of miles away, and if you, quotes, measure one and say it becomes up instantaneously, the other is, for example, down. But light cannot have gotten between the two in the interval. So Einstein thought that spooky action at a distance, it's been confirmed. The universe is non-local. Well, given non-local, spatial, and temporal, it allows for the possibility of famous psi phenomenon. Uh, so I'm going to show you there's now quite astonishing evidence that there is psi phenomena, but that requires that mind be plantum, quantum. So one of the psi phenomena is psychokinesis. The idea is that mind can have physical consequences uh, elsewhere. Astonishing experiments have been done for 30 years. Uh, people place quantum random number generators around the world. It, it has been done, the data is available. And when, when a major event happens, like Nelson Mandela dies and everybody is astonished by it, the question is, do the quantum random number generators behave in some non-random way? And the answer is they do. There is 30 years of data on it. Uh, it uses a, a meta-analysis but but in fact the data is good to 7.3 sigma well that's huge it's something like one in a billion so one is driven to say there's something going on 
where mind is having an effect on quantum random number generators, it's got to be quantum. There's very good evidence now for telepathy. Uh, I've actually experienced it once or twice. So if mind is quantum and there's non-locality, I can be non-locally connected to you if we are both quantum. So telepathy is possible. And there's evidence for that at six or so sigma, which is again, something like one and a couple of hundred million. And there's very good evidence for precognition. My own wife has had an astonishing experience. So there's some evidence already for quantum mind. It's, it's, it's very much good enough to pay attention to. Next slide. Now I want to take on the mind body problem. So we all know, we all know Descartes and his res extensia and uh, res cogitans. So Descartes said, uh, the, and this is the mind body problem. There's res cogitans, mind, which is a substance and res extensia, which is a substance. And somehow Descartes wanted mind to act on body. Well, as soon as uh, Newton came along, that runs into the following problem. In classical physics, the current state of the classical physics brain is entirely sufficient for the next state of the classical physics brain. So there's nothing for mind to do and no way for mind to do it. So that's the standard mind-body problem. Furthermore, if consciousness happens, that consciousness can be aware of the world and witness it, they cannot change it. That's compatibilism. If so, why did mind evolve? It can play no role in the becoming of the world. Heisenberg in 1958, and I uh, rather independently proposed the following. Heisenberg said, the quantum state is not an actual, it's a kind of Aristotelian potentia standing halfway between an idea and reality. So you need to know about quantum superpositions. I think you do. It's, it's the, Heisen, it, the uh, Schrodinger cat alive or dead. And the statement the cat is simultaneously alive and dead does not obey Aristotle's law of the excluded middle in which it's impossible for the cat to be simultaneously alive and dead. It's a contradiction. But try the word possible. The cat is simultaneously possibly alive and possibly dead. That's not a contradiction. So Heisenberg proposed, and I want to with him, that the world consists in ontologically real possibles and ontologically real actuals. And measurement or actualization converts a possible to an actual. So this is Heisenberg's view. I will advocate it too. Notice that it's not a substance dualism. Possibles are not substances precisely because they don't obey the law of the excluded middle. So it does not inherit the mind-body problem. And as far as I know, it's the first philosophic approach and quantum approach that adds a new concept and a new way of thinking about the mind-body problem. And as soon as you say it, there's a possible role for mind. Mind actualizes quantum potentia. Well, it's not a new idea. Von Neumann said it, Wigner said it, Abner Shimane said it, uh, and Andrea and I are saying it. Mind actualizes quantum potentia. The astonishing thing is there's now evidence for it. Dean Radin has done the following experiment. It's now been done 28 times. You sit either next to Dean or somewhere a thousand miles away. And he says, try to alter the intensities of the adjacent light and dark bands of the two slit experiment. And you could do it a little bit. It's now established that data supports it at, at one in 50 million. Well, that's very, very good. If it's true, it alters the foundation of quantum mechanics. This is mind plays a role in quantum mechanics. It means that responsive will is not ruled out because you can do it. One in 50 million is strong. If it was one in you know, 10 billion, we'd start to really accept it. It's enough to take seriously. Next slide. That means we can do it. So here's the hypothesis explicitly for the mind-body problem with consciousness. Our mind-brain entangles with the world in a vast superposition. We try to, and we do collapse the wave function to a single state. We experience that state as a qualia. So that's, that's the hypothesis. 
our mind brain entangles with the world in a huge superposition, we collapse the wave function to a single state and we experience it as a qualia. So there's supporting evidence. Next slide. Andrea, yeah. David Chalmers, philosopher of mine, points out that qualia are never superpositions. He suggests, therefore, that consciousness plays some role in the collapse of the wave function or the actualization. We agree. Second, we just saw that finding a novel affordance is not a deduction. You do not deduce from the fact that the engine block can be used as a paperweight, that it can be used to crack open coconuts. But the collapse of the wave function is also not deductive. So the two can fit together that way. I find that quite compelling. And the third is, next slide, please. We've already shown you that universal Turing machines um, mean something further. The evolution of the biosphere with, with philosophic zombie organisms can only stumble upon new affordances and see them and seek and seize them by heritable variation and natural selection. Well, it works, but it's very slow. What if we are conscious and aware and free willed, which we all want, which is what Eva just referred to, which we can be by what Andre and I just said. Next slide, please. So there it is. In stunning contrast, given uh, Raiden's result in where we can free will collapse the wave function, we are sentient, free will organisms. We can literally perceive new affordances, search for, pay attention to those affordances. We have responsible free will and we have preferences and emotions to choose and act and use them. Watch a cat and a mouse near a low chest of drawers. The chest affords the mouse a hiding place. The chest threatens the cat with mouse escape. We do this all the time, so did T-Rex. The resulting selective advantage of mind rapidly seeing affordances via experienced qualia due to mind actualizing quantum potential and free will choosing and acting is enormous. So there's an enormous selective advantage. Next slide, please. Therefore, we can say, if we accept this, what we want in this entire group. Mind did evolve with diversifying life, and it did play a large role in the evolution of life that was far more rapid than were organisms' philosophic zombies. Niche construction is at least one major area in evolutionary biology where purposes behavior plays a role. Next slide. So, I now want to turn to a possible trans-Turing system in the remaining few minutes. We've already shown you that a classical physics system can't do it. Well, I think there's a way of something, inventing something that's not a quantum computer. It's something that may be much more interesting. As you all, well, it's, it's interesting. You all know that there's an enormous effort focused on um, quantum computers. They have to maintain quantum coherence until decoherence sets in. And then they have a measurement and achieve a solution, which is often a minimum on a complex classical potential. Then the computation stops. Cells don't stop. So what's going on? Well, you know there's abundant evidence for quantum biology. Next slide. So in the past decade or half decade, several of us have worked on something that we're calling the poised realm. It hovers reversibly between quantum and classical behavior. Uh, we've shown that molecules can be quantum critical, which lies at the metal insulator transition. They have delocalized wave functions, conduct electrons well, power law slow decoherence. Next slide, and then I'll be able to be done. Living cells may very well be transferring systems, and I think that there's a reasonable chance we construct them. So living evolving cells may well be trans Turing systems and coming to your point, Eva, they may perfectly well be conscious. Can we just slip to the last slide, please, Andrea? Next slide, please. Next. Okay, conclusion. Artificial intelligence is wonderful, but it's algorithmic. We're not algorithmic. Mind is almost certainly quantum it is an increasingly plausible testable hypothesis that we try to and do collapse the wave function. And final slide. 
If we collapse the wave function, we really may be able to perceive affordances as qualia and seize them by preferring, choosing, and acting to do so. We, with our minds, play an active role in evolution. The complexity of mind can be evolved by natural selection with and further the complexity of life. And last, since Descartes lost his race cogitand, mind can act in the world. <laughs> Thank you. I thought that line was kind of fun. I'm sorry, <laughs> I, wasted, I'm sorry I wasted three minutes. Thank you very much, Stuart that was, uh, and Andrea. That was fantastic. Uh, I'm afraid we are just about on time, so um, we can't even uh, thank you properly. But anyway, that was that was super, and I look forward to seeing uh -oh. the missing slides later. Um, okay, so we must move on. I have it uh, at seven o'clock here, local time, uh, and we now have a four-author presentation with contributions from Bethesda and Nymogen led by Professor Eugene Koonin, who is somewhere on the west coast of the USA, right? Oh, east coast of the USA. The title of their talk is A Theory of Universal Evolution as a Learning Process. So over to you, Eugene. Thank you. Okay, I will now start my talk. I hope you can see my slides. Everything's okay. good. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Uh, uh, so I have to st uh, start with thanks to the organizers of this interesting and highly unusual meeting and an apology uh, um, uh, because uh, um, uh, the talk that I'm presenting now actually does not um, too closely correspond uh, um, to the abstract. In full confession, I was I was hoping to present a new theory we are actively working on now, uh, but at the end of the day, I thought it was too much a work in progress. Uh, so I will share some previous idea and and evolving ideas on the uh, evolution of biological complexity at the interface on conflict and cooperation. Mm. To a large extent, this is the discussion of ideas and sketches of theory, but we will also see some actual data. Uh, so it makes sense uh, to begin here uh, uh, with the, uh, the, the, the most famous or uh, brief but momentous, uh, uh, momentously important book of Erwin Schrodinger, uh, What is Life? the physical aspect, aspect of the living cell. I think we have already seen uh, the cover of, of Schrodinger's pamphlet uh, today. Uh, I'll just switch to the laser pointer, uh, which will work better. Uh, so um, uh, in, in, in this uh, classic book, Schrodinger uh, proposed several um, uh, very consequential and important ideas, uh, uh, one of which is that organism feeds upon negative entropy, uh, um, uh, attracting, as it were, uh, uh, a stream of negative entropy upon itself to compensate the entropy increase it produces by living, and thus to itself, uh, maintain itself on a stationary and fairly low entropy uh, uh, level. Then, whether or not negative entropy is a good phrase from the strict point of view of physics, or uh, uh, the idea is crucial uh, that organisms uh, evolve uh, uh, and exist uh, uh, by uh, reducing entropy, by uh, maintaining themselves uh, uh, in uh, a non equilibrium stationary state. Even more important and more general idea on which we will elaborate today, is that living matter, uh, while not eluding the laws of physics as established up to date, is likely to involve other laws of physics, hitherto unknown, which however, once they have been revealed, were formed just as integral a part of science as uh, the former. The fundamental laws of physics cannot be uh, defied uh, by anything and by uh, living uh, organisms in particular, but that does not imply that there are no uh, mm, uh, 
perhaps also very important, uh, roles that pertain to complex and in particular living system. Uh, and to um, uh, um, uh, further emphasize uh, um, the importance of, um, of such potential new roles, uh, um, we skip to 1972 uh, um, to uh, um, another uh, um, uh, pro most prominent uh, condensed matter theorist, uh, Philip Anderson, uh, with this uh, um, uh, famous paper, very simple but famous and uh, um, uh, seminal paper, more is different, broken symmetry in the nature of hierarchical structure of uh, um, uh, sites. Um, so so um, uh, Anderson uh, spoke in this article uh, um, uh, about the hierarchical um, organization of science, but I believe, and, and we shall try to illustrate that in the rest of this talk, uh, that these principles uh, pertain to the organization of the uh, entire world, and in particular, uh, uh, the, bi the biological uh, uh, world. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, the elementary entities of science X, say chemistry, or uh, um, uh, obey uh, the laws of many uh, uh, body physics, or uh, and as we all realize very clearly, uh, um, uh, molecular uh, um, uh, uh, biology uh, obeys the laws of chemistry. So, uh, um, and this this principle uh, permeates the entire hierarchical uh, um, organization of uh, um, uh, of the world in 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 a manner of renormalizability, uh, uh, speaking in um, uh, physical uh, terms. Uh, Anderson illustrated this uh, um, uh, by, by this, um, I don't know, fictional or real uh, conversation between um, two uh, famous American writers, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, and Ernst Kemming, where it happened in Paris uh, sometime around in early 1920s. Uh, Fitzgerald, the rich are different uh, from us. Hemingway, yes, they have more money. Uh, mm, so the question is, uh, mm, the crucial question to address is, is that really so? Uh, mm, uh, that uh, mm, uh, mm, the rich are different only because they have more money. Uh, or uh, mm, there are properties that emerge from this situation and are not readily predictable. Uh, so, uh, um, another um, uh, skip of um, uh, 30 years or so, uh, um, and we get to these uh, um, interesting, though much less famous, uh, publications of other uh, um, uh, prominent uh, physicists, in particular Bob Laughlin, the Nobel Prize winner, and, and David Pines, uh, um, the first of which has this telling name, uh, the theory of everything, and they present here uh, uh, these two equations uh, from quantum electro electrodynamics, uh, which for all practical purposes, they say, uh, uh, comprise the theory of everything for our, our everyday world. However, it's obvious, glancing through this list of, they have the list of problems there, that the theory of everything is not even remotely a theory of every Think. So these laws apply, and the principle underlying uh, mm, the entire structure of the world. However, they're exactly useless uh, mm, if we want uh, mm, uh, to understand how, for instance, living organisms uh, mm, live and evolve. We need something else, uh, mm, something uh, mm, uh, different. Mm. Uh, and uh, the ideas on that something different uh, mm, are proposed uh, in this other uh, notable paper by Bob Laughlin and others uh, entitled The Middle Way, uh, where they indicate, among other things, that particular attention is paid to the possibility that as yet undiscovered organizing principles might be at work at the mesoscopic scale, intermediate between atomic and microscopic uh, mm, dimensions. Uh, these new laws that mm, Schrodinger alluded to might emerge at 
different scales. I'll skip another um, uh, 18 years in this case, not that long, uh, um, to our own work with um, um, a senior member of my lab um, at the NIH, Yuri Wolf, uh, and a prominent physicist from um, condensed matter physicist from uh, Radboud University in the Netherlands, uh, Michael Katzenson, uh, where we try to address the physical foundations of biological complexity and how complexity could evolve in biology and beyond. Mm. Uh, mm, uh, so we argue in this paper that the physical foundation for understanding the origin and evolution of complexity, including the unprecedented hierarchical complexity of or um, biological systems can be thought at and particularly gleaned uh, and possibly gleaned at the interface between the theory of frustrated states resulting in pattern formation in glass like media and the theory of self organized uh, um, uh, criticality. I will illustrate this uh, in, in a moment. Uh, um, but our conclusion from this paper, which I think I will try to. Um, um, emphasize and elaborate in, in the, in the uh, rest of my talk um, is that frustration caused by competing interactions in multi-dimensional systems uh, could be uh, mm, their general. Perhaps we should, this is ambitious, maybe we should have said a general, but let it be. As we say, uh, the general driving force behind the emergence of complexity within and beyond or the domain of biology. So competing interaction with frustration in physics and biology. It's actually quite, at, at the qualitative level, it's quite simple. Um, the, um, well, when we speak of competing interactions, what we mean is uh, that the functions uh, that, are um, uh, that are optimized in different scale uh, um, are different. Uh, so one functional is optimized on a on a small scale um, or um, of a system of, of um, uh, many interacting particles, whatever they are, and a different functional uh, um, is optimized on a larger scale in um, in condensed matter physics in, uh, in glass-like systems. In particular, uh, this uh, um, results in complex potential surfaces. Uh, and um, in the correspondence between um, uh, phenomenological thermodynamics and uh, um, population genetics, which I do not have really a chance to discuss today, uh, um, uh, potential is equivalent to fitness. So uh, our main thesis perhaps here is that in uh, um, uh, biology, a uh, complex uh, um, uh, fitness uh, mm, uh, landscapes emerge uh, from frustrations caused by uh, competing directions. And as I said, I also need to introduce uh, mm, the important notion of self-organized uh, mm, uh, criticality that has been developed by another uh, outstanding uh, mm, physicist, Per Bach, uh, in uh, 1980s and 1990s. Uh, mm, um, and the idea, again, uh, mm, uh, is fairly uh, mm, uh, simple, mm, uh, namely that in mm, uh, systems of many particles, such as, for instance, a sand pile, mm, very simple one, seemingly, uh, mm, the particles tend to organize in such a manner uh, mm, uh, that the mm, um, scale of occurring events is distributed according to uh, a power law. This is the distribution this from, from Buck's publications, and this is the distribution of the extent of the wildfire, unfortunately, uh, um, a very topical subject for the area where uh, Stuart Kaufman is now. Uh, and this illustrates the famous example of Buck, uh, sand pile, uh, where you uh, mm, uh, keep mm, pouring a little sand on the pile, and uh, from time to time there are avalanches. 
mostly they are small, or, um, or, but sometimes or, um, or there is a big avalanche, a transition, so to speak. I'm deliberately using that word. Uh, um, uh, and the distribution of the size of the avalanche is again follows the power law. Uh, so uh, this is a picture of, of the um, uh, process of evolution of complexity, starting with frustrated molecular interactions, uh, um, proceeding to uh, um, uh, um, structures and tem temporal patterns that begin to be complex, or complex that um, are uh, non-homogeneous and including a variety of patterns, uh, which result in, results in non-ergodic dynamics and uh, um, uh, emergence of self-organized criticality, and accordingly, uh, multi-level selection, which leads to evolutionary transition. So if we, if we think about it, uh, um, uh, biology, and of course not only biology, is permeated by, uh, um, uh, um, uh, is full of competing interactions and frustrated states. Uh, we can see this in the protein structure uh, um, in the uh, competition between uh, um, uh, small scale and large scale interactions, uh, um, which uh, um, uh, result in the uh, in protein folding and emerging emergence of stable uh, conformations. We can see that this in gene regulation network. We can see it. Uh, in uh, genetic uh, systems where there is inevitable uh, intrinsic uh, competition uh, between uh, uh, the genome of a cell, let us say, and uh, the uh, multiple uh, parasite uh, genomes, uh, as well as uh, viruses and transposons and plasmids, uh, all kinds of mobile genetic elements. Uh, we can very obviously uh, see it or in multicellular organisms where the functions that are optimized for individual cells and for ensembles of cells are quite different. And the loss of control over the functions of the lower level entities, individual cells may result in aging. In short, we see these competing interactions and frustrated states across the entire realm of uh, mm, uh, biology. Mm. I also want to continue uh, mm, uh, mm, the parallels with uh, condensed matter physics uh, and in uh, this classic paper by uh, mm, Phil Anderson uh, mm, by uh, pointing out uh, mm, uh, that uh, mm, phase transitions, uh, both in uh, mm, physics and biology are intimately linked uh, to fundamental broken symmetries. And we can see many of these uh, in uh, biology, uh, um, such as the famous central dogma, whereby the information flow goes only from nucleic acids to proteins, uh, um, such as host parasite interaction coevolution, uh, whereby uh, um, uh, the host is responsible, so to speak, for all production of resources. Parasites may more or less nothing. Uh, between dividing and quiescent cells in multicellular organisms, and so on. You can uh, follow, again, uh, um, the key point here uh, is the recapitulation of phenomena at different levels of organization. You can see these fundamental broken symmetries at all levels. Mm. Uh, so by, uh, by way of summarizing, I would just like to show our notion of the uh, evolution of complexity in biology and beyond uh, by this succession of uh, um, phenomena. Competing interactions uh, brings about frustration. Frustration begets a uh, um, pattern glass-like state. Uh, um, uh, and these uh, um, result in non-ergodicity and self-organized criticality. Accordingly, evolutionary transitions punctuated equilibrium and multi-level um, uh, selection. Uh, because competing interactions, frustrated states, and from that matter, self-organized criticality, are by no means limited to life. Uh, hence, neither, I believe, is evolution 
or um, evolution of. Mm, we have already heard uh, mm, uh, in the course of this meeting about the major uh, mm, uh, transitions, the concept of the major transitions in evolution, uh, mm, uh, which uh, was first uh, mm, um, presented in detail in this famous book uh, by John Maynard Smith and Charles Shatmari. Mm, uh, and the idea, uh, the idea of Smith and Shatmari was simple but powerful, uh, mm, uh, that uh, mm, evolution, uh, biological evolution, uh, mm, uh, does not proceed smoothly, uh, mm, uh, but rather uh, it may proceed relatively smoothly on long intervals of time, uh, mm, uh, but uh, mm, uh, that does not result in the diversity and complexity of the life forms we observe. For this to, mm, uh, to come to be, uh, mm, mm, um, there are essential evolution of mm, major transitions in evolution, and each of these includes evolutionary transition in individuality and the emergence of new levels of selection. And this is now my addition. In all these transitions, we see the same pattern. Conflict begets cooperation. This applies to origin of cells, origin of eukaryotic cells, multicellularity, new sociality, society, or, um, uh, again, throughout all levels of biological organization and even uh, um, uh, beyond. Um, um, uh, so uh, um, very, very, very quickly, uh, um, what I believe are the two major drivers of the major uh, evolutionary transitions are um, um, not, not now in general terms when we spoke about pulsations, competing interactions, it is there, uh, but more specifically uh, at the biological level. Uh, the major drivers are the pressure from parasites and evolution of uh, defense, uh, which promotes the complexification of the host, and pressure uh, from resource production and allocation or the use of public goods, so to speak, which again promotes cooperation and the emergence of new levels of biological organization. From the purely physical uh, um, uh, point of view, uh, um, uh, the major transitions in evolution can be represented as adiabatic uh, first order transitions where uh, um, the entropy remains constant, uh, but the uh, um, temperature uh, um, uh, changes. Uh, um, here, here it's illustrated the, uh, um, effective population, the, the drop of effective population size, which is characteristic of the emergence of uh, more complex uh, life forms. But in the parallels between uh, um, uh, thermodynamics uh, and population genetics, uh, effective population size is effective to inverse uh, temperature, whereas the equivalent of entropy uh, remains constant. So there is simple and clear uh, physical representation of the major transitions in evolution. I will switch gears somewhat um, and become more specific in these last um, um, few minutes of my talk today. Uh, um, uh, I will become a bit more specific and more biological and speak of cost parasite conflicts and cooperation as major driver of uh, um, evolution. First of all, when we speak of the, um, of the uh, role of cost parasite coevolution, we must remember a, crucial, a simple but crucial fact. Uh, the dominant biological entities in the biosphere are actually not plants, not animals, not even bacteria, but viruses. There are more virus particles on Earth that there are cells, that there are anything else. So without considering such objects, there is no chance to understand biological evolution. Moreover, it can be shown uh, uh, theoretically that emergence of parasites is strictly inevitable in biological um, uh, evolution. More formally, parasite protected states of replicators are thermodynamically unstable. So, uh, um, so they don't exist for a long time. Parasites necessarily emerge. And um, um, the next concept uh, um, that I want to try to and explain is the uh, evolutionary unity of uh, um, selfishness and dependence. The guns for hire, as we formulated with my uh, colleague Mark Korbovich from Institute of Pasteur, uh, um, uh, whereby uh, um, uh, the same 
components are extensively used uh, both by um, mobile genetic elements as, uh, so to speak, offense weapons and by the host as uh, defense uh, uh, weapons. So uh, um, the process of coevolution is not um, of uh, parasites and hosts is not a simple process of arms race and conflict. Rather, uh, it is a, a, a process that involves entanglement of uh, um, uh, conflict and cooperation. You, Eugene, what? you have four minutes left, please. Yes, I have four minutes left. I realize okay. that. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, and, uh, um, and so I have to go uh, um, very quickly uh, through uh, um, a few um, um, additional ideas illustrating this uh, evolutionary entanglement of mobile genetic elements <coughs> in the systems, as illustrated on this slide, the CRISPR uh, um, system. And uh, um, again, uh, bringing uh, um, uh, up the crucial point. Uh, that uh, battles between different mobile elements actually protect the host, such as the fact that there is virus cost cooperation. The hosts recruit viruses uh, um, uh, for defense and other uh, functions. Now, we have to, uh, there are many and many examples of this evolutionary entanglement of parasites. And hosts, unfortunately, we have to go through this uh, um, uh, very quickly and just summarize uh, 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 by, by emphasizing that perennial parasite host conflict and arm races combined with co-option of mobile genetic elements for cellular functions, defense, but far beyond, drove evolution of cellular organisms, including the whole cells, the first cells, multicellularity, and most likely other methods. This is a major biological universal, if you will. And now I would really like to present a new um, scenario, um, scenario for the um, origin of life uh, um, developed on these ideas by myself and my colleague, uh, Puri Lopez Garcia from Université Paris Saclay. Uh, um, but effectively, I have no time to do that, unfortunately. Uh, um, uh, but uh, um, uh, very quickly, the idea is uh, um, uh, that the origin of life consists from a mutualistic merger of reproducers, that is phys reproducing physical structures of um, uh, cells that provide supplies for all kinds of um, biochemical reactions and replicators, mobile genetic elements uh, um, that include viruses. But um, in reality, the cellular genomes are also a form of replicator, only not parasitic, but cooperating uh, fully uh, with the reproducers. Fortunately, I don't have the opportunity to present you details, and I will just uh, mm, uh, mention a, slow, uh, a few concluding thoughts. Uh, mm. So complexity appears to be an inherent consequence of frustration caused by competing interaction. In that sense, we may say that this is a teleonomic phenomenon. Um, there is an inseparable entanglement on conflicts and cooperation that permeates and drives evolution. Life can be um, represented as a merger of reproducers and replicators that become mutualists. Again, another emergent uh, um, uh, phenomenon. Um, so I think I already formulated this. Conflicts begets cooperation and vice versa, driving the evolution of complex systems, importantly, both physical, chemical, and biological. All these factors are universal properties of evolving systems. So I dare ask, is emergence of life actually likely under suitable or uh, chemical uh, um, uh, conditions? Many people, including myself, have tried to somehow on the back of the envelope, uh, uh, calculate uh, the odds uh, for the origins of life. And the odds are quite terrible. It seems to be uh, virtually impossible, and we need to uh, invoke the multiverse or something like that to, uh, um, to account uh, um, for the origin of uh, life. But could it be that we are actually barking under a wrong tree 
and the um, emergence of uh, um, life is uh, um, more or less a natural result of the evolutionary drive for complexity, starting in purely physical chemical evolution. And to, the last thing to say is, our goal here is a general theory of evolution. And if such a theory is possible, it hardly can describe a unique phenomenon. And here are uh, my collaborators, uh, my colleagues from, 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 my, from my lab, uh, and my uh, collaborators uh, from uh, different uh, parts of Europe who made the uh, uh, key contributions. And thank you all very much for your attention. Okay, Eugene, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, very challenging. And I look forward to seeing the, uh, the, the Peter and I will look forward to seeing the manuscripts. <laughs> okay, I'm afraid we have to move on. Thank you. Uh, we have to move on. It is precisely 7.30 local time here in the UK. And I see the face of my dear friend, uh, Kalibi Cole, who is our next speaker. And uh, Kalibi is from... Uh, Tartu in Estonia, and he's going to address the question, how do organisms choose? Over to you, Kalibi. Thank you. You need to unmute, Kalibi. Dear friends and lovers of biology, <laughs> uh, I would like to share my screen Please host, give me this opportunity. You should be able to share, Kalevi. Could you try again? Yes. All good. Does this barn swallow have a freedom of choice where to sit or any other organism? Whether well, life has some freedom. Is freedom an attribute of life? If yes, then what are the minimal conditions for freedom? I'm going to speak about the sources of a piece of, of, the piece of freedom in life or uh, primary subjectivity, if you like. And uh, let me use as a motto uh, the words uh, from Victor von Weizsäcker a German physiologist who used Jakob von Uexküll's model of functional circle and developed it further, describing the Gestalt circle, Gestalt and time. He wrote, life is not a sequence of cause and effect, but choice. I'm a biologist. I've worked with birds and plants as a field ecophysiologist, studied theoretical biology, and stepwise arrived to understanding that life is deeply related to meaningful information processes, which is the aspect studied by semiotics. Now I'm working in the field of biosemiotics at the University of Tartu, Estonia. The focus of my talk is basically the two recent papers which both speak about choice as a biological process, one by uh, Brothers Noble and other by myself, and not only these. So our aim is larger and more fundamental to introduce the concept of choice into biology. Of course, I can only introduce the topic of choice in organism briefly. Um, um, There exists some more recent work which shows that the concept of choice and freedom are relevant to biology. For instance, a book on animal choice by Michael Yudanin, or a volume, Naturgeschichte der Freiheit, Natural History of Freedom. Also, uh, our colleagues from Edinburgh University recently organized a project called Living Organisms and Their Choices, where I was happy to take a part. A choice is a strange concept because it fundamentally includes a feature due to which it has been largely avoided in the natural science. Choice is the phenomenon that is situated exactly on the border between physics and semiotics, between the natural sciences and the sciences of mind. 
which means it will also allow to connect these two cultures. Moreover, the choice is also in the heart of the contemporary big paradigm change in the understanding of evolution. That's uh, why to talk about it today in this teleonomy conference. The problem of choice is fundamentally related to understanding of evolution. The contrast between neo-Darwinian and post-Darwinian paradigms includes a couple of oppositions. Either organisms are replication devices or they are causal interpretive agents. Either environment selects or organisms choose. Either the main factor of evolution is passive natural selection or active organic fitting. Or as uh, every experienced biologist certainly understands, evolution is based on both. But then the question is in which relationship? This uh, contemporary debate under the label of uh, extended synthesis or third way has uh, some similarities with the debates of a uh, century or a century and a half ago even. Uh, indeed, the topic of our meeting, teleology and teleonomy, takes us back to the late 19th and early 20th century when this was widely discussed in biology. On the other hand, the return to these discussions means that the scholars of the time understood something important that was largely forgotten or devaluated for some time in the biological thought. First, of course, the major opponent of Darwin among his contemporaries, Karl Ernst von Baer, my countryman. He was already made the distinction between teleology and teleonomy using the terms Zielstrebigkeit and Zweckmäßigkeit, really close to the later teleonomy teleology distinction. Another work which provides an extensive analysis and review of directedness of evolution together with providing many biological examples is Nomogenesis by Leo Berg, which was published in Russian in 1922. Berg was a leading anti-Darwinian scholar in Russia at the time. It is remarkable that the English translation of Lefberg's book was introduced by Darcy Thompson and Theodosius Dobzhansky. And the third one to add here is Jakob von Uxkel. His uh, distinction between the two kinds of adaptedness precisely corresponds to the contrast what is at stake now. Jakob von Uxkel writes, the eye tone of an organism that acts in its specific umwelt is not the result of a gradual adaptation, unpassing in a long time, as Darwin thought, or the influence of the environment on the individual development of an organism, as Lamarck thought, but of its adjustment or fittedness, einpassung. After reading these classics of biology, which I expect every biology student should do, it is reasonable to ask, what uh, can we add to them, to Bar Berg, Uxkel? The uh, roots of the post-Darwinian paradigm go back at least to the concept of organic selection, which is opposed to natural selection as defined by James Mark Baldwin, namely organic selection can be interpreted as pointing out the role of organism free choice. Conway Lloyd Morgan had similar ideas. Charles Sanders Peirce, when writing on agapastic evolution, is ascribed creativity to organisms. Later, Jean Piaget emphasized the role of organisms' choices. Lynn Margulis states similarly, organisms choose. Also, for instance, Ben Williams writes, all behavior is choice, in the sense that there are always alternatives other than the response measured by the experimenter. Thus, the animal is always deciding which response to perform. Thus, the idea that organisms make choices is not new. John Sahari Young mentions, the realization that choice is a property of all living things gives us great help in understanding the world and our place in it. And one more argument from more recent times. 
This is about the question of composition of biological communities. Whether organisms, species, which live together in a community are those which co-evolved. That means they fit to each other because of the millions year co-evolution, or they have chosen to live together because they fit to each other. That means either co-evolution or ecological or semiotic fittedness. This is the question formulated by Daniel Janssen, who is a tropical ecologist working in Costa Rica. He writes, it is commonly assumed that a pair of species whose traits are mutualistically congruent have co-evolved. For example, it is quite possible that the fruit, st fruit traits of a mammal dispersed seed co-evolved with the mammal's dietary needs. However, it is also quite possible that the mammal entered the plant's habitat with its dietary preferences already established and simply began feeding on the fruits of the species that fulfilled them. When this occurs, it is those species that are most exactly congruent with congruent, which will appear most co-evolved, yet are likely to be the least co-evolved. And more from Daniel Janssen. A major part of the Earth's surface may be occupied largely by organisms that are rich in ecological interactions and have virtually no detailed evolutionary history with one another. The main process in evolution in this case is not natural selection measured by fitness, but semiotic fitting. Semiotic fitting is defined as the agent's capacity for making and preserving the local habitual learned bonds, meaning the agent's functional or communicational match with its surrounding. The processes based on semiotic fitting are fundamental for organization of ecosystems. Since the agents are often intra-organismal, semiotic fitting can be responsible for many changes in evolution and development of organisms. Actually, the same distinction was made by Jakob von Uxkul between unpassung and unpassung, passive or active, selection or choice. However, we can uh, go on and notice that while pointing on choice, this is more than plasticity. In case of plasticity and epigenetic inheritance, organisms' freedom is not yet necessary. Therefore, it is reasonable to make an additional distinction which results in three basic types of evolutionary mechanisms. One classical neo-Darwinian, in which new comes from random mutations. Then second, based on the role of plasticity and self-organization. And the third, in which case the innovation is based on choice. And all these three mechanisms have the neutralist and the adaptivist versions. The neo-Darwinian, the epigenetic and the semiotic evolution can all be both neutral and adaptive. We should make distinctions between these. An important point here is also that choice can be neutral, which means that there can be an arbitrary choice even without any purpose or goal. In other words, this means that choice is more fundamental than goal or purpose. Goal and purpose presuppose the capacity to make choices. But now closer to the concept or model of uh, choice itself. The problem of understanding choice is probably most fundamental and most challenging in today's bi biology. Choice includes uh, choice of food, choice of habitat, choice of partner, choice of direction of movement, etc. While in order to be a choice, it uh, should be in some extent free. Our aim is to analyze the general features of choice process. I'll try to explain this as based on two recent works which directly address the problem of choice in living beings and provide a model of choice. Let us now look uh, how Noble and Noble describe it. Their account divides the process of choice into five stages. First stage, an environmental challenge has occurred, but not yet a solution in the organism's reactions. 
we conjecture that uh, such a problem can be viewed as a puzzle analogous to the form of a template for which a match is needed. Second stage, instead of an automatic response, therefore, the organism must search amongst existing stored possible fits uh, to the problem template. Third stage, the organism activates stochastic processes within itself to generate further possible new solutions. This is where novelty arises. Thus, the organism triggers the resort to stochasticity, but no longer controls it just as the immune system doesn't directly control which mutations occur. Here, the options at this stage are effectively infinite. Fourth, the organism returns to direct control at this stage, which is to compare what is thrown up uh, by the stochastic process, which the problem template uh, to uh, determine what fits. And uh, the final stage, implementation of the discovered action uh, to solve the problem. Let us now use the nice, this nice account for an attempt to get deeper into the understanding of organ, organic choice. Two points should be given a particular attention. First, what is the relationship between chance and choice? And second, whether this model is algorithmic or not. Stage one states the condition of problem. What can be seen as a problem for a living being? Here we are in a fascinating area of biology because there has not been almost uh, any serious discussion in theoretical biology on the concept of problem. What is a problem in an organism's life? What can be seen as objectively a problem for an organism? That thus let's face the problem of problem as a problem for theoretical biology. As one of Karl Popper's uh, writings was entitled, a world without natural selection, but with problem solving. If there is uh, some way to react, then organism simply reacts. And that is not a problem for it. Problem obviously means that there are alternatives, the options and the and indeterminate situation to decide which of the alter alternatives will be implemented. But how can there um, be alternatives? Not for an external observer, but for an organism itself. Stage two says, Instead of automatic response, therefore, the organism must search. But if the search goes according to some algorithm, then it can be said to be automatic, therefore determined. Even learning can be automatic. We define learning as the traces from choices that influence further choices. It seems that the process as described by Nobel and Nobel can be described as algorithmic. In order to search in order the search to be a choice, it should be, however, indeterminate, which means it should not be based on some algorithm, which means it should not be sequential. If there is for each step a given way to behave, even if the situation is new, then there is no indeterminism, no freedom. Once again, what does it mean instead of automatic response? How can that be that uh, there is a physiological, uh, there is physical body in some environment and the system doesn't know what to do? From a physical point of view, this is absurd because the system behaves in some way anyway. However, it makes, the point makes sense if we have in mind the situation in which more than one way is open, more than one possibility in time. In order there to be choice, that means alternative ways to behave, there should be a situation in which the alternatives are somehow presented. And in order that these to be alterna alternatives, these should be presented simultaneously. There cannot be freedom due to stochasticity only. Also, an algorithm doesn't provide freedom. Freedom can be only due to multiple possibilities in inter interpretation due to indeterminacy in decision-making, which means due to arbitrariness, the main concept of Saussurean semiology. While considering situation when the alternatives are provided to organisms simultaneously, then the true indeterminate situation can appear. A little scheme might be of some help here. Landscape with branching valleys. If rolling downwards, then the branching points at bifurcations, that is not a choice. That's rather pure chance. 
Indeed, Waddington, when describing the epigenetic landscape, did not speak about choice. But change your sight and assume that the close end here is the higher one. If climbing upwards, that means when doing work, as any agent does, the situation could be different than on the earlier picture. Still, if the climber is blind, then the situation is not much different from the previous one. The path taken will be random. But if the climber is not blind, which means it has receptors, which can provide a sign in advance about the two or more possibilities, then the choice can be possible. Just what it needs is to see both paths, both paths, both valleys simultaneously. In principle, two receptors might be sufficient for this. Here, however, an additional feature is implied because simultaneity means a brief moment of present. This is a teeny period in which what is presented can be simultaneous, can be seen together without determined sequence. That is what was described by Jakob von Uebskel as Umwelt, as internal model of environment, which begins from most simple construction of space and time. The elementary process, which includes a piece of indeterminacy in order to be an interpretation, is called semiosis. Semiosis is where choice happens. Semiosis is then another concept that general biology has to accept and naturalize. That's also how information gets its content. The information organisms are using has its content called meaning or quality. That's the whole realm studied by semiotics, the qualitative meaningful information. The problem of teleology is essentially about the problem of time and freedom as these exist in living beings. There are several types of directionalities in development and evolution. Most of these mechanisms are deterministic or a mixture of stochasticity and determinism. What we are pointing out here is that there is also a place for a process which is based on indeterminacy, which is not randomness, which means not chance, but choice in the conditions of indeterminacy. This is also a question of the source of novelties in organic life. A problem or a problem situation for an organism in the general sense is a situation in which the behavior has to be indeterminate and the choice making has to be possible. This occurs if a coupled functional systems face mutual incompatibility. For instance, perceptions from two sense organs order the opposite actions of the same effector, or a perception orders two effectors that lead to opposite actions. This is, a, this is a situation in which organism behavior is not fully determined by its habit. That means when organism is a little bit confused when it has to negotiate between the options. Due to motivatedness provided by homeostatic mechanisms or needs, the choices organ you know, organisms are making are not random. They are certainly deviated or motivated, but in all these cases in free life, the behavior is neither fully determined nor stochastic. There is still at least a little space for choice. Theory of evolution has been extended considerably by including epigenetic inheritance, niche construction and harnessing stochasticity, but it will be radically richer than Darwinism if a process based on the free choice will be included, which means as assuming that organisms do have some freedom, allowing something like choice to take place at first place. The extended synthesis cannot be completed without including choice and thus semiosis. So in conclusion, Living beings evidently have some freedom in their behavior, which justifies the application of the concept of choice in biology. When analyzing, however, the primary processes, 
that even the simplest choice presumes, then we arrive at the question of how a living being is constructing its space and time. And in however a simple way it does. This aspect of biology, how organisms obtain their umwelt, how they start building their models of the world, how they build meanings, is an important field of research for biology now and in the future. Biology is wonderful. Biology is meeting semiotics now. Biology has to meet semiotics. Thank you so much for attention. Well, thank you very much, Kalevi, for a very clear uh, presentation, full of interest, and yet another amplification of what we have heard uh, from many others already. Uh, it, it, this is this is really exciting. Um, now we are a little ahead of schedule, thanks to your very careful presentation. Uh, but as this, as earlier today, we're going to use that as just a little bit of a break. Uh, for uh, reflection, or indeed <laughs> anything that is even more pressing than that. So we'll start again in about three minutes um, at uh, at the hour. Uh, it's eight. It will be eight p.m. here in the UK. And when at eight p.m. we will have our last talk for this session, uh, which is a recorded uh, presentation. Anyway, we're going to have three minutes. Uh, sort of peace and then we'll start again in about three minutes time. Thank you all very much indeed and thanks again Kalevi for a splendid presentation.
So, hello again. I make it uh, exactly on the hour. So this is now our last, but certainly not least, presentation for today. And we have another duo, Dan McShay and Gunnar Babcock, both from Duke University in the USA. It's a pre-recorded talk. They will speak to their title, An Externalist Teleology. Uh, over to you, Padma, to press the necessary buttons. Thank you. Um, can someone let me know if this is full screen? Because I realized that it wasn't full screen. Is this okay? Uh, that you had it full screen a moment Hi, my ago. My name is Gunnar Babcock, and uh, I'm going to be presenting an externalist teleology today with Dan McShay. Um, I'm going to take the first half of this presentation, and then Dan's going to take over for the second half. Um, we're at the Department of Biology at Duke University. Okay. So the kind of overview of what we're going to be uh, arguing for is, I'm gonna start with um, Aristotle and a division he makes between two types of teleological explanation. Uh, one's uh, artifactual kind of model and the other is a natural model. And then I'm gonna talk about problems that seem to be present in the, the division between teleological explanations that way. Um, and then I'm going to kind of summarize the bit that I'm doing um, by emphasizing that it seems as though the external model or the artifactual model of goal directedness is relatively unproblematic, while the internal model um, seems to be subject to most of the criticisms most uh, associated with teleology. Um, at that point, I'm going to hand it over to Dan. And Dan is going to talk about field theory, which is a, a theory we've developed a little bit in this project, but it's based on work that Dan's been doing for uh, over a decade. And um, field theory represents a much more robust version of a, what we take to be kind of an external teleology. Um, and then Dan's going to address um, what we take to be kind of the hard cases, uh, which are development and intentions and um, how field theory is actually able to explain development and intentions better than any of the internal models are able to do so. Okay, so um, let's say Aristotle teleology and the artifactual natural distinction. So um, Aristotle argues at the beginning of the physics uh, when he kind of introduces uh, teleological explanations that there are really two kinds of teleological explanation. Um, the first is one that looks to an external source of motion or change um, for how a thing uh, has the goals that it has and is directed in the ways that it's directed. So um, these would be the things that Aristotle calls artifacts and uh, kind of one of the classic examples that he uses is if you want to explain um, why a house is the way it is, uh, you, you point out the builder, whoever built the house. Um, that explains why the house um, developed and was directed uh, to take the form that it has. Um, and in that way, very clearly, the builder is external to the house, it is the cause of the house. Now, Aristotle also says that um, there are internal sources of motion and change uh, that direct objects, and these would be, for Aristotle, the natural objects. So in a case like this, again, just a, a very basic example would be something like if I go to the market, um, I'm displaying a, a teleological kind of behavior there. And um, to explain that behavior that uh, you might point out something like my intentions. I had the intention of buying bread and that seems to explain why I got in my car and went to the grocery. So, Two types of explanations, uh, according to Aristotle. Now, how do the two compare? Um, for Dan and I, uh, and it seems like the majority of the scientific community, and certainly for, for most biologists, it seems as though um, an external source of direction is um, teleologically, for um, teleological entities, it's common and, and they're unproblematic. Um, you know, pointing towards something like um, a builder building a house, you know, it doesn't require any spooky metaphysics. Now, 
On the flip side, however, um, internal sources of direction seem to introduce problems for teleology. So um, metaphysically, it seems like when you look to the interior of something uh, to explain why it is exhibiting the type of behavior or development that it has, um, there you kind of end up with this infinite regress that takes you further, further back, uh, looking for something to be causing that inside of the entity. And of course, this kind of, is in our view of things, this is where a lot of the vitalism of the 19th century uh, starts looking for something like a god or a soul or something that's metaphysically dubious, um, at least in, in the sciences. So um, it's this type of teleological explanation, the internal or natural uh, model of teleological explanation that seems to be the really problematic one, the one that most of the criticisms that have been directed towards teleology um, throughout history are, are made at the second one. And the first one's pretty much unproblematic. Okay, so how does this relate to what Meyer is up to uh, with telonomy? Well, um, for Meyer, um, instead of pointing towards something that seems kind of outright metaphysically objectionable, um, what Meyer is trying to do is uh, make a division and suggest that the teleonomic processes are um, un undergirded by something like a program. Um, so, uh, teleonomic process or behavior is one which owes its goal directedness to the operation of the program. And kind of on the face of it, this seems better than, than positing something like a, you know, a deity. Um, however, um, notice that this follows the old script. Uh, it's looking internal, internally to teleological entities to locate their goal directedness. And it's what Aristotle would have considered a natural model or an internal model of teleological explanation. Um, now, there's more nuance in there to be talked about for sure. In, in certain ways, uh, Meyer departs from Aristotle's natural model because he definitely thinks that such kind of internal programs can extend to artifacts like human programmed things. Um, so there would, you know, there's more to be said there, but really um, I'll point out that uh, Meyer does say that Aristotle's kind of conception of an eidos or form um, it really has many remarkable similarities to what he considers a genetic program. So for Dan and I though, um, the question that kind of lurks in the background of what Meyer is up to is, are, are genes really developmental programs? And I think that there are a lot of reasons to maybe suggest that that's a mistaken view or at least a problematic view. Um, this is linked up to all sorts of problems related to you know, what is information actually. Um, and if you can figure that out, or does DNA count as information? That's very unclear. What's the causal role that genes play in something like development again? that's very unclear and kind of fraught with all sorts of problems um, that's really unfolded in a lot of the philosophy that's been done since um, Meyer introduced this notion of, of telonomy. So um, the question that we have is, do you need to go this route? And we really think you don't. Um, there's no need to follow this searching for goal-directed behavior via some internal explanation to a teleological entity. So the example that we kind of focus on um, is going back to Aristotle and really observing that Aristotle himself actually ran into this problem in, with spontaneous generation. So he encountered difficulty with the division that he made. And there are really clear cases of this, just even when you think about inanimate natural objects like rocks, it seems like they want to naturally move downwards. Um, but of course, you don't want to look somewhere internal of the rock to explain that. It seems like really what's doing that is something like gravity, a very external field. So um, a lot of interesting Aristotelian scholarship therein, um, 
Cohen has a great paper on that if you're interested. Um, but a better place to kind of look at some of this uh, actually comes from um, Aristotle's theory of spontaneous generation. And uh, numerous people have actually criticized Aristotle for being inconsistent here. So Hull and Lennox have done this. And um, what's going on with spontaneous generation is that Aristotle observed that certain species, uh, say like shrimp, um, appeared to be gener um, generated spontaneously. Now, you know, why Aristotle thought this has a lot to do with kind of observations from that time. Um, but essentially, he thought that what was going on uh, was not something like sexual generation, where you would have form coming from the father and matter coming from the mother. Those come together and you get something like the form or the program or some continuity from parent to offspring that helps direct development. In the case of these kind of shrimp and things like that, um, Aristotle thought that they just kind of appeared when the right, the right external forces of water and earth and air and fire would come together and you would get this kind of, all of a sudden you just end up with shrimp. Um, and if that's how shrimp were to really come about, it doesn't seem like there's any sort of regular routine form that's being imparted to the shrimp. So you're missing that internal source of directing or development for shrimp. So this is a problem for Aristotle. It, shrimp are natural entities, yet they don't obviously conform to the natural model of teleology that he's laid out. So such species just don't fit the natural model. Um, and of course, there's a lot of interesting stuff in Aristotelian scholarship that kind of addresses how Aristotle can make himself consistent with this. Um, I'm not gonna go into that right now. Mostly what I wanna look at is how to resolve the tension. And it seems like if you set aside how Aristotle himself aimed to resolve the tension, the obvious solution is to just look at this division that he makes and reject it between natural objects and artifacts. And in fact, in rejecting the division, what you can do is just instead accept that there's only one kind of teleological explanation, which is Aristotle's artifact model, um, or what we would call an externalist teleology. Now, of course, um, what Aristotle presents with artifacts is a pretty primitive version of it um, from our perspective. Um, so you get this external or artifactual model. And the question is, can that model do all the explanatory work that it needs to do? Um, and so can an external teleology explain all the teleological entities that we find, particularly throughout the biological world? And um, Dan and I think, yes. Uh, we actually think that field theory is such a model that it actually is able to just defer to external sources of change in motion um, and using Aristotle's terms. And uh, I'm gonna hand it off to Dan to now explain this. Thanks, Gunnar. Here there's only time to give you a warp speed overview of field theory. If it goes by too fast, I'm sorry about that. I refer you to <clears throat> our paper, Babcock and McShea 2021 in Synthase and externalist teleology. I don't know if I can share my screen. We have recognized five general categories of goal-directed systems, in particular the first one, a physiological behavioral system. An example of a behavioral system would be a bacterium following a food gradient or a moth circling its home. An example of a physiological goal-directed system might be temperature homostasis in mammals. Innumerable examples could be mentioned here. Second category is technological goal-directed systems, for example, a homing torpedo or a GPS system. We think of evolutionary adaptation as natural or natural selection as a goal-directed system in which a lineage tracks a fitness peak, a lot like a homing torpedo tracks a target. These first three are the easy systems, easy in the sense that it's easy to see how the directedness 
for the goal-directed entity is external. The last two are harder. In developmental systems, acorn turning into oak tree, uh, embryo turning into adult more generally, it looks like the direction has to be internal, like it comes from the genes. And that was Meyer's solution to the problem. Human intentionality, wanting, preferring, intending. Again, it looks like the directedness of human intentionality comes from inside somewhere. <clears throat> We're gonna argue in both cases, developmental and human intentionality, the direction is external. We're also gonna argue that all these systems share a common architecture, that in all cases, the entity is directed toward goals by an external field. We call it field theory. <clears throat> Before I get to it, uh, a historical note, uh, 20th century philosophers of science, uh, some of them were interested in the, in the question of how to define goal directedness, coming up with necessary and sufficient conditions for it. Notably, Ernst Nagel came up with the, the idea that persistence and plasticity and a couple other features were essential to defining goal directedness. For him, persistence was the tendency of an entity to return to a trajectory toward a goal after perturbation. So for him, persistence was error and correction, error and correction, the consistent finding of a trajectory toward a goal after uh, mistakes are made, after deviations occur. Plasticity for him was the ability to find a trajectory toward a goal from alternative starting points. Again, this was a philosophical project. His interest was in defining goal directedness. We're going to adopt his persistence and plasticity criteria, but not in the interest of using them definitionally. For us, they're just signature behaviors of goal-directed systems. Ours is an engineering project to discover um, in causal terms how persistence and plasticity are achieved. Our externalist theory, again, is field theory. It's derived from hierarchy theory. Uh, the intellectual debt is to Stan Salty, Bill Wimsatt, Herbert Simon and Donald Campbell. Uh, Gunnar and I argue that there are four architectural features of goal-directed systems. We're only gonna talk about the first two here. The first one is hierarchy. A lower level entity within an upper level field characterizes all goal-directed systems as a hierarchical arrangement. Um, <laughs> something the goal-directed entity nested within, physically within something else. And then um, upper directedness. Our claim is that lower level goal directed entities are directed by an upper level field. That they, the upper level field is a kind of boundary condition, a large external structure of some kind that tells the upper, the lower level goal directed entity where to go, what to do, how to behave. I'm going to give you a we'll walk through some of these um, easier examples. Easy in the sense that it's easy to see how the direction is external. In this cartoon example, uh, a peanut butter sandwich has been thrown in, into a pond and a substance, aspartate, is diffusing out of the peanut butter into the pond. It's leaching out into the water, forming a gradient. And that's what's shown with the red dashes, those red lines. Uh, that's the aspartate gradient. Then in the upper left, you see a bacterium with a flagellum. It feeds on aspartate and it's moving up gradient in, goal, in a goal directed way toward the peanut, peanut butter sandwich propelled by the flagellum. Okay, its behavior is persistent and plastic. Um, it deviates all the time. A lot of the time it's not actually moving up gradient at all, but when it doesn't, it corrects and moves back to an up gradient trajectory. In other words, in our terms, it's moving up the food field. It's moving within and up the food field. Also, its behavior is plastic. If you were to start it somewhere else in the food field, in the aspartate gradient, it would also move um, up gradient. The system is hierarchical. That bacterium is physically nested within the field and it's upper directed in the sense that the food field is telling it where to go. It's the source of information about where a higher concentration of aspartate is. Now this will sound strange to some, the notion of a field as a source of direction, but let's consider the alternatives. It could be, you might wanna argue that the sandwich is the source of direction, but that's not gonna work because the sandwich lies in the bacterium's future and can't direct it along the way. Another possibility that might occur to you is the internal mechanisms of the bacteria do the directing. 
the complex gene switching network inside the bacterium controls the flagellum. But that's not going to work either, because while those that gene switching network is critical to goal directedness, absolutely critical to goal directedness, it can't provide the direction. It can't tell the bacterium which way to go. Information about which direction is up the food field, up the concentration gradient, just isn't there in the genes. It needs to come from outside. It needs to come from the food field, which of course is external to the bacterium. Um, an example from the second category, um, uh, technology. What you see here is a submarine in the lower right that launched a homing torpedo toward a target ship. The behavior of the homing torpedo will be persistent and plastic. If a current carries it off course, it'll correct and come back to a trajectory toward the target ship. And it could be launched from many alternative locations, provided they're all within the sound field coming off the target ship, it'll find a trajectory toward the target ship. The system is hierarchical in that the torpedo is physically nested within the sound field coming off the target ship, and it is also upper directed, upper directed in the sense that the sound field is telling the torpedo where to go. You might want to look to the internal mechanisms of the torpedo, the complex electronics going on within that torpedo as the source of direction, but again, as for the bacterium, the information simply isn't there. The information about where the target ship is, which way to go, where to turn, when to turn, that sort of thing. That information can only come um, <clears throat> from the sound field uh, coming off the back of the target ship. GPS uh, systems, we could make the same similar arrangement. As I said, we think of evolution by natural selection as goal-directed, um, and for in, in this context, it means a lineage immersed within an ecological field is directed persistently and plastically toward a fitness peak. And in the example shown here, we're talking about the evolution of neck folding in turtles. In modern turtles, uh, the animal can pull the head under the shell to protect itself from predators. There's a cool system of hinged vertebrae inside the neck that allows it to do that. Well, the ancestor 200 million years ago couldn't do that. And what this figure is supposed to show that in an arbitrary two-dimensional phenotype space, the ancestor with the oval on the lower left moves under the influence of natural selection toward modern neck folding turtles in the upper right. The solid arrow shows the trajectory of the turtle lineage and the straight arrows show the field, an ecological field, or really it's a predator field because that's what's driving the system. And the lineage is moves within this predator field toward, uh, toward the fitness peak. The system is persistent in plastic. Mutations are happening all the time. Environmental changes are taking place. Um, it moves peri peripatetically, but always in a goal-directed fashion up the fitness peak uh, toward greater adaptation. And the direction that it's getting is coming from outside. It's coming from ecology. It's coming from predators. So again, this is externally directed. Uh, the structure is hierarchical. The behavior is persistent in plastic and so on. Uh, development is a somewhat harder case, um, <clears throat> somewhat more complicated case, but we think we've, uh, we can explain how direction is not internal the way Meyer would argue, but it's external. Uh, we're going to look at the patterning of uh, segmentation in a fruit fly. In the lower left, you see a fruit fly embryo. The future head is on the left, the future tail is on the right. <clears throat> this, like all developmental systems, is hugely persistent and plastic meaning deviations in development are taking place all the time and the system is correcting to arrive at a fairly uniform and predictable morphology as an adult. So how does this work? Well, in the egg state stage shown in the graph in the upper right, <clears throat> what the graph is showing is um, expression of mRNAs in the embryo, anterior on the left, posterior on the right. You can see that mRNAs for bicoid are high on the left and for nanos, uh, they're high on the right. <clears throat> it turns out these mRNAs are coming from mom. Mom is telling the embryo which end is going to be the head and which end is going to be the tail. Obviously, mom is external to the embryo, so that's an easy one. Later in development, though, it gets more complicated. The embryo sort of takes over its own development from mom, and in the lower right, what you see are two new gradients, two new mRNA gradients, hunchback in red and caudal in green. 
uh, these are these substances, these mRNAs are generated by cells within the embryo, not by mom. So this looks like a good case for internal uh, directedness. But in fact, it's not because while the substances come from the cells within the embryo, from the genes within the cells within the embryo, what's doing the directing is the gradient as a whole. That's what's telling the se segments what their identity is going to be. That's what's structuring the embryo as a whole is those large scale hunchback and caudal gradients. So it doesn't matter that the substances themselves are coming from the cells. The substances, the mRNAs <clears throat> by themselves are not doing the directing. It's the gradient, the mRNA gradients that are doing it. And they are external to the cells, external to the DNA, external to the segments, way larger in scale than all those things um, that exist on the scale of the embryo as a whole, in fact. So again, direction is external. Um, wanting, preferring, intending. We're going to make a case here um, uh, <clears throat> that, that human intentionality is actually a case of external directedness. This is a somewhat speculative case. We start with Hume's distinction between affective and non-affective brain processes, what he called passion and reason. Non-affective processes are thinking, perceiving, calculating, imagining, in other words, the cognitive processes. Affective processes are wanting, preferring, intending, emotion generally, or in a word, motivations. Our proposal is that cognition is a goal-directed entity. That's the goal-directed entity that's governing our behavior, our conscious behaviors anyway. And the directing external field is a neural field. It's affect. Affect is a neural field of some kind, and it's large and encompassing of cognitive mechanisms. That's our proposal. So the system, as we understand it, is hierarchical. Cognition is small and nested physically inside of affective neural fields. Direction comes from above. Direction of cognition comes from above cognition, from outside from these affective fields. In other words, wanting directs thinking from above, from outside. All of this is internal to the brain, of course, but our argument is that affect is external to cognition. So let me give you an example, a concrete example. Uh, suppose I wanna get a piece of cheesecake from the fridge, various cognitive processes are involved in getting the cheesecake. Those processes are persistent and plastic. As I decide to get up and walk to the fridge to get the cheesecake, the phone rings, I answer it, I have a conversation, I hang up, and I go back to a trajectory toward the fridge. And of course, that trajectory could start from any of a number of different locations within the house. Um, it's my cognitive processes are behaving plastically as well as persistently. <clears throat> Gunnar and I are claiming uh, that the system is hierarchical that wanting the cheesecake is a field, one that envelops cognition, external to an enveloping of cognition, and that the system is upper directed, that the affect field, the wanting, directs, the cog directs cognition uh, to do what's necessary to get the cheesecake. In other words, wanting directs thinking. Wanting is larger than and external to thinking. This is a trivial example on a small time scale. We would claim that the same architecture exists on all time scales. Uh, intending to go to the post office, deciding to buy a house, wanting to be a tennis star, intending to be a good dad, the architecture, cognition within, um, <clears throat> within affect would be the same. I want to close with a perhaps tantalizing or bizarre concluding remark that, that will seem to come from nowhere. Uh, the puzzle of goal directedness is a puzzle in time. It's a case of seeming backward causation, the future causing the past, the goal causing present behavior. It's obviously not that, but our solution is that the problem and the solution are both spatial, that it's the field that's solving the problem that's doing the directing. A goal directed entity at any given moment is nested within the field and for it the field is everywhere no matter where it goes in space and therefore no matter where it goes in time there's the field telling it where to go goal directedness is field-based external field -based. okay well thank you very much we'll stop there and i hope you'll forward any questions you have to us by email Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Dan and Gunnar, for bringing today 
today's presentations to a close.